Hey everybody, it is Wednesday and so that means it's time for Colossians. We are in Colossians chapter 4 and we're actually probably, probably, going to finish up Colossians today uh, with just a few notes on chapter 4, some things to ponder, and then we will uh, move on with something else next week. At the end of class today I will tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing next so you can be looking forward to that and reading up on it, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> But for today, we're in Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to pick up in verse 2. You remember last week we covered through the end of uh, verse 1 with the household code that Paul was talking about. So here at the end, he's going to give just a couple of um, last-minute instructions to the Colossian church um, and make some requests, those sorts of things. So we'll just highlight some, some things. Uh, we won't go too deep into anything just highlight a few things, and then we will uh, move on. So starting in verse 2, he says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well that God will open to us a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. And just ending there at the end of verse 6, I want to just highlight um, kind of an undercurrent that runs through uh, these instructions and really all of the instructions that Paul has been talking about. This is what we've been talking about for a few weeks now as regards the development of virtues, things like that. But notice the language he uses. He says, Devote yourself to prayer. Stay alert in it. Uh, with thanksgiving. So that notion of devotion, uh, you're devoting yourself to prayer, you're going to stay alert in prayer uh, with thanksgiving. He requests that we pray, the, the Colossians pray for him in his situation. He is in prison and wants the opportunity to declare the word and to declare it clearly. And then he says in verse 5, uh, saying, devote yourself to prayer, be alert in prayer. Uh, he says to conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the time. And then he talks about the way that we speak to others so that we um, can conduct ourselves, answer others properly. And so the undercurrent that I want to pay attention to here is that for Paul, the Christian life is a very intentional thing. Uh, it's something that's done on purpose. It's something that's thought out. It's something um, that we set our minds to do, and then we we push in that direction. And so he says something uh, very similar to that effect in uh, Ephesians, and we've been comparing Colossians and Ephesians a lot throughout the course of this study. They are very similar in their content. And he doesn't ad address this in Colossians in such terms, but uh, he kind of gets at that intentionality in Ephesians where he says that, and this is in chapter 4, starting, um, I think, around verse 11. He says uh, that God gave um, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to the church to equip the church to do the work of Christ. And then he goes on to describe that work uh, for which the church has been called, uh, that work that the apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists are equipping the church, preparing the church uh, to do. And he talks about it in terms of growing up and, and being mature, being like Jesus. But it's interesting, one of the things that uh, he highlights there is the metaphor he uses. He said, um, um, I don't. I want you to go to a point. He would say that you're not just tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. So you could picture something like a, a leaf just blowing in the wind, whichever way the wind blows. Or you could talk about um, or think of something that is being tossed about by the waves and the stormy sea, or something like that. Paul says, I, I don't want you to be like that. Um, you sit back and you think about it, it's relatively easy to be like that. Uh, if you're like me, you've got some experience with that, just kind of going this way and that. And, and living in a world where we just react to things. So something happens and then 
we give our hot take on that thing. Uh, that's all the rage these days. What is your hot take? What is your immediate reaction, your knee-jerk reaction to this thing or that thing or the other? And what has resulted in, in our culture, is this sort of outrage culture where we're mad about something all the time. And um, I don't want to deny that there are things that are worth being mad about. But there is an undercurrent, this reactionary undercurrent that suggests that oftentimes we're not thinking things through, we're not acting intentionally, we're not moving from some deeper, stable place of commitment or devotion. We're just kind of bouncing from one thing to the next. And, um, and it lacks any sort of depth. And so... Um, <clears throat> Paul here is in practice instructing the Colossians on how to do the sort of thing, the, the growing up into Christ, the, the stability, the not being tossed this way and that way by this thing or that thing being pulled to and fro. He's giving some practical instructions on how to do that. And so what he does is he paints a picture of a Christian life where we are very intentionally um, entering into the various circumstances of our life. We are, for instance, remembering what we are here for. Um, remember some years ago, Patrick Mead was uh, teaching, and I, I got to hear it, and he was talking about various uh, habits of prayer that he had developed over time or that people he knew had developed over time. And one of the things he talked about is that he, he has to work at, and I've tried to make this a part of my life, you have to work at... Um, remembering why you're stepping into a space, remembering why you're going into uh, any particular circumstance that you're in. Um, and so he asked the question, it's a kind of good basic example, your, your wife or your husband or whoever sends you to Walmart and you're supposed to get a gallon of milk, a screwdriver, and a tub of mild guacamole. And so you got the list and then he asked the question, why are you going to Walmart? And uh, we would be tempted to answer so that we can get um, a gallon of milk, a screwdriver, and a tub of mild guacamole. But he points out that that's not really why we're going to Walmart. That is uh, part of the reason. But at the end of the day, we go into Walmart to represent God inside that space. When we go to work, to represent God inside that space. We go to school to represent God inside that space. We go to the ball game back during the days when we did things like go to ball games or concerts or wherever you might go to represent God inside of that space. We we go to church to represent God inside of that space. And so um, he, he said with that in mind, that intentionality, he made it a practice. To as he was walking into any given space, he uh, wanted to stop for just a moment and say a prayer, uh, reminding him of why he was there, of this larger purpose that God has drawn him to, and asking God to help him uh, have ears that hear, eyes that see, and hearts that uh, a heart that understands as he's in that space. This is the sort of thing that Paul is pushing for with the Colossians. Enter into the circumstances of your life and remember what you're about, who you're here for. Um, so throughout the New Testament, uh, New Testament writers, particularly I think of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, he will pick up the language of the Old Testament, particularly of the book of Exodus and Exodus 19, where Israel is called out of uh, slavery and around Mount Sinai and the Lord is about to give them the covenant and the law. Um, Peter picks up that language and it's echoed in different ways in Paul's writing. It's, it's there. But he uh, says to the church, Peter does in First Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 8 going down through verse 10, he says, you are a royal priesthood and you are a holy nation. And that is as the people of God, which he points out, uh, you once were not a people of God or you once were not a people. And what he means by that is some of you were Greeks and some barbarians and some Jews and some Gentiles and some of you were slave and some of you were free. There was no cohesive factor there. He says you weren't a people, but now you are. Uh, you have been brought together. You've been reconstituted as a people, a, 
a family, a nation in Christ. And he says, your job is to stand before the world, to live before the world in such a way that demonstrates God's way in a world that has rebelled against God. And for Peter, that's going to fundamentally reshape uh, how we look at everything we're doing. Uh, again, no matter what situation we walk into, we are in that situation to be uh, the holy nation, the royal priesthood. And all of that is is language, again, that says that we are there to represent who God is in a world that has forgotten who God is, to live a certain sort of life, this new humanity, the way that Paul has been describing it in Colossians chapter 3 going into chapter 4. And the result of that... Peter would say, uh, as you get to verse 11 of 1 Peter chapter 2, is that we are aliens and strangers. We are immigrants. We are foreigners. We don't belong in this world. We are here for the world, um, but we stick out. You know, and to do that, to kind of pick up on that, we, we have to have that intentionality to be the people that no matter what is going on in the world around us, whether it be an economic boom or an economic crash, whether things are going well and we're at peace, or whether it's a time of war, whether there's an election that is obvious or contested, whether your guy wins or the other person's guy wins, to remember who we belong to and what we are here for and what we're about is um, of utmost priority. And so Paul uses going back to Colossians chapter 4, this language of intentionality. When you are speaking with someone, you want to you want to season your language with salt, you want to give consideration, you want to be intentional about how you answer people so that so that you can represent the one to whom you belong. When you interact with others, you want to do so wisely, making the best of the times uh, remembering who you belong to. You want to be devoted to prayer, to uh, be um, diligent in focusing in on that with thanksgiving so that you can stay grounded in that identity to the one to whom you belong. And so all of that to say that this isn't the sort of thing that happens accidentally. It's not the sort of thing that just happens by osmosis. So if I go to church and I say enough prayers and I read my Bible enough and... Uh, I listen to enough sermons and I sing enough songs. It's just going to kind of soak into my bones. That's, that's a part of it, but we have to even do worship intentionally. Worship is that space where, where we learn to love our neighbors because when we go to worship, there are going to be people who are drastically not like us. And so we're, we're going to practice things like submission and, and sacrifice and service and blessing others. But also it's going to take being intentional about the way we live our lives but asking different sorts of questions and having different sorts of priorities and living out those priorities in different ways than our neighbors. This is sort of what we've been talking about, this intentionality when we talk on Sunday morning about the politics of Jesus. Um, you will recollect, or perhaps you won't recollect because we've all slept since then, at an early stage in that conversation, I pointed out that the New Testament will not uh, answer many of our political questions, but it's going to teach us to ask better questions. It's a part of this in, intentionality that Paul is getting at. So um, at the end of Colossians, he's going to say, you know, I want you to be awake. I want you to be alert. I want you to live life with Jesus on purpose. And we're going to get that wrong sometimes, but those are the times where we get up and we go back and we do it again. Now, at the end of Colossians chapter uh, 4, and by the way, this is obviously my lunch break at work. It is not live. Um, if you have questions, you have comments, those sorts of things, be sure and uh, get in touch with me or leave those questions and comments. I am not on Facebook anymore, at least not for the time being. I've kind of taken a fast from Facebook with all the craziness going on. Jerry or uh, Ronnie or sometimes Michelle have been kind enough to upload this link to to the Facebook page for us. Um, but if you leave a comment, that will get back to me. We will address those comments, those questions, those additions, subtractions, so on and so forth. Uh, so just a note there. Um, at the end of Colossians, starting in verse 7 and going all the way down through the end, Paul is going to, to, going to go through this litany of names. And he's going to talk about all of these concerns with these particular sorts of people. 
And uh, we are not going to take the time to go through all of these. It is interesting, by the way, in a couple of places. One he mentions in verse 9, for instance, um, Onesimus. Onesimus was the slave who had escaped in the book of Philemon. He had escaped from Philemon and found Paul, became a Christian. And um, Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon with this letter saying, uh, you know, last time you saw him, he was a slave, but now he's your brother. This is that household code that we were talking about last week. You know, as soon as... Um, whether or not Onesimus is freed as a slave in any sort of technical legal sense, as soon as Philemon takes seriously the charge to treat Onesimus like a brother, and as soon as Onesimus takes seriously the charge to treat uh, Philemon like a brother, um, all of the things that kind of undergird that institution of slavery begin to crumble, and it won't stand for long under sort or, or those sorts of dynamics um, in the practicing of the thing. Okay, so there's a Onesimus there. Um, one other note that I wanted, and then we'll spend just a minute talking about what we're going to talk about starting next week, and we'll quit kind of early. That's kind of what last chapters are, are for. Uh, one other note that's just kind of interesting. Uh, Paul goes through all of these different people, and uh, at one point in this conversation, he goes through a list of people, and he says, these are... These are all of the, essentially, the Jews that are with me. And then after that point, he starts listing off the Gentiles that are with him. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, that's verse 11, by the way. Uh, These are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God. They have been a comfort to me. And then in verse 12, he's going to start talking about the Gentile co-workers. And uh, Luke, down in verse 14, is... um, counted among those Gentile authors or Gentile co-workers. And so um, we were talking last week about how it is in the living of the gospel that those walls that we tend to erect tend to fall down. And that's a big thing for Paul. No more Jew, no more Gentile, no more slave, no more free, no more male, no more female, no more Greek, no more barbarian. Uh, Or the the language of Ephesians chapter 2 starting verse 11 where Jesus has brought the two humanities in that case, talking about Jews and non-Jews together to make one new humanity. Uh, this is a huge theme for Paul. And here, kind of tucked away right at the end of the book of Colossians, we have just this little note. It's the only note you're going to find like this, that that Luke is a Gentile. Luke, who wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke, is a Gentile. Luke, who wrote the, the book of Acts, is a Gentile. Uh, and as far as we know, I mean, we don't know who wrote... Um, Hebrews, and I guess we don't know for sure who wrote most or many of the books of the New Testament, although we, we have good evidence to point us in certain directions. Luke is Luke is the only one that we know of for sure that wasn't a Jew. And so even in the writing of the New Testament, we have this, this broadening of the world of what God is doing in the world. And we have what I think this is a re- really cool note, uh, just something to think about. You know, Luke was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And here he is in the New Testament. Those walls are being torn down. Those walls coming down even in the pages of the New Testament and who wrote them. Okay, so that is the book of Colossians. We could have taken a lot longer and done a lot more justice to it. It is a wonderful book, but hopefully that will at the very least whet your appetite and uh maybe prompt some questions, encourage some further study for you. Be happy to pursue any of those questions if you want. Um, But starting next week, uh, and I haven't quite decided how I'm going to do this, probably just going to do it piecemeal. I want to engage in a variety of studies um, that will, will work to tie the Old Testament and the New Testament together. And so what I want to do is this, starting off, is in the book of Exodus, there is this repeated theme about God hearing the cry of the oppressed and then answering in his faithfulness the cry of the oppressed. 
And this is, as we will see, a theme that actually showed up, although less explicitly, before the book of Exodus and the book of Genesis. It is a theme that from the book of Exodus on runs clear through the entire Old Testament, and it finds its fulfillment in the New Testament. Um, the fulfillment, not that just this was a prophecy that we could check off of a box, but it finds its high watermark, its fullest development in the New Testament in in places like the life of Jesus or in what Paul has to say at the beginning of Romans chapter 8. And so uh, what makes this important, though, and we'll talk about this at great length um, over the next few weeks, is that when God highlights that, that particular theme in the book of Exodus, he hears the cry of the oppressed, and he answers that cry in his faithfulness. He makes uh, a great effort to tie that in to the core nature of who he is so that when we say this is who God is, uh, the book of Exodus would have us remember that hearing and answering the cry of the oppressed is uh, always like the next breath. This is who God is. He is the one who hears the cry and answers the cry of the oppressed. And it's a big theme. I've been studying this for the past six months now. Um, I've had some basic notion of it for a lot longer than that. You probably heard me talk some about it before if you were in my Sunday morning classes, we went through Exodus, that sort of thing. But I really want to unpack it because I want us to get at who God is and I want us to wrestle with what it would mean to follow that sort of God, okay? And so I'm going to stop about eight minutes early and I hope you guys have a good week. And we miss seeing you guys. Uh, hopefully, uh, things will continue to develop, uh, hopefully in a positive direction rather than a negative direction, so that we can see you again soon. We'll talk to you later.